I invite you to remain standing out of respect for the gospel reading, which today comes from Matthew's gospel, the 28th chapter, known as the Great Commission. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them, I've received all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. I read a story about a baseball player named Larry Anderson. He was a pitcher with Houston in San Diego. He was a middle reliever who spent a lot of time in the bullpen. And bullpens, I understand, can be kind of lonely places to be, especially for someone with a philosophical mind and with a fertile ground for the imagination to just take you away. And so in the bullpen... Larry Anderson contemplated what he called unexplained mysteries of the universe. And among those mysteries that he said are unexplained that he could not understand were these. Why is there an expiration date on sour cream? Why do people park in a driveway and drive on a parkway? Why do fat chance and slim chance mean the same thing? And why do your feet smell but your nose runs? Unexplained things. Well, I'm kind of like Larry Anderson. There are many things in life that I have trouble explaining. Many things in life that I truly do not understand. I will be heading to Florence this afternoon and this morning. Richard asked me, he said, now how do you get to Florence from here? What, what highway do you take? I said, I'm really not sure. My smartphone will tell me how to do it. Now, I don't know how my phone knows where I am and where I need to go versus the person who's right beside me and where they need to go. How do all that data get transferred in the airwaves and not get confused? How can I be sure that my phone is not going to send me to New York instead of Florence? I just trust. There are many things in life that we can't understand or explain but we have to accept and live by. That's true for our existence, and that's true for our faith. There's much about life and faith that remains a mystery to all of us. And the Trinity is one of those doctrines of the church that the church rightly calls a mystery. A mystery. Our questions about who God is and how God can be one but known in three persons as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we call the doctrine of the Trinity. But no preacher and no theologian can explain it. And yet we try. We keep trying. Every year on Trinity Sunday, we are asked to look at this doctrine of the Trinity and to think about it. Irish preacher, preachers like to use their national emblem, the three-leaved shamrock. Some early preachers used the term root and shoot and fruit. And others looked at the sun with this ray of light and the point of the ray that touched the earth. And you will hear many preachers today refer to God as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Not just Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But somewhere along my seminary education, I read that for very early Christians, they liked to celebrate and refer to the Trinity as a dance. And maybe some of you have seen this portrayed in artwork around the world. A dance. A dance used to demonstrate power and grace, majesty, love and tenderness, presence and movement of the divine. 
I had the wonderful opportunity yesterday to spend time with my beloved grandson, Joey. Joey is now 19 months old, and he loves music of all sorts, whether it's coming from one of his little electronic toys or something on television, or whether it's something that I or others are singing to him. And the minute he hears music, he starts just moving all over the place. He loves to dance and move. I think most children do. There's something freeing about moving and dancing. But as I watched him dance, I thought about the intricacies of dance and the fact that the Trinity is a dance, a dance between creator, redeemer, and sustainer, a dance of motion, a dance of flexibility, a dance of rhythm, a dance of emotion. The nature of the relationships of the Godhead is a beautiful dance of movement in and out and flow. The divine dance was dubbed perichoresis using the Greek word choreo, which is the way of persons of the Godhead contained and filled by the others for that beautiful flow of a dance, beautiful flow of the dance. In this dance of the partners, they not only encircle one another and weave in and out between each other as in human dancing, but then in the divine dance, it is so intimate to the communion that they move in and out and through each other, that that pattern is all inclusive. And so we say we worship one God. We worship not three, but one. We worship the unity, the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in other words, that tension, that beauty, that mystery of the unity is really about a relationship a relationship built on love. Now, a point of clarification here. Unity does not mean sameness. If God wanted sameness, God would not have created the world that we see all around us. Look around the room at all the differences. All the differences that you see. Even the people seated beside you, even if they're your own family members, they look different. They think different. They feel different things. God created beautiful diversity in this world. And the Holy Trinity is a model of the kind of unity that we are called to embrace in the midst of the diversity. Diversity, a unity that is communal and relational. In the reading from the Gospel of Matthew that we read today, we zoom in on a moment after Jesus' resurrection. Jesus is commissioning his disciples to go forth and to make more disciples. And he tells them to go, therefore, into all the nations. All the nations. I focused in on that word, all. Because think about the diversity in the nations. Think about the diversity from community to community, from culture to culture, Jesus sends them out to all nations, knowing full well that each nation is saturated in its own context, with its own culture, its own language, its own traditions. And I think that's why the Holy Spirit came with the diversity of languages on Pentecost Sunday, to help bring us together as a human race. Each nation is different but by uniting different nations into following Jesus Christ, Jesus is inviting the church on this mission of unity. Jesus is inviting the church into the tension, into the interrelationship, into all of the differences that we have. And he commanded those disciples to baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, reminding them that there is diversity in the unity of the Godhead as well. And because of the diversity of cultures and context and personalities, we all know that the expressions of Christianity have been shaped by the environment in which the people are populated. There is truly no such thing as one Christianity. Instead, there is a groundswell of many Christianities. 
conservatively, I have read that there are about 34,000 different denominations recognized within 21st century Christianity. But some other faith counters put that number much, much higher, parsing Jesus' followers around 122,000 different tribes. Now, there are two dangers to this splintering of Christianity. And the first is, if everything's called Christianity, then nothing's called Christianity, right? If everything goes, then nothing st is standard. Not every spiritual sputtering can be called Christianity. But the second danger is a hazard that I think we fall into. It's a hazard that I read about that every baby chicken faces. Now, I don't raise chickens myself, but I know several of you have chickens in your backyard and that maybe you were raised on a farm and you know something more about chickens. But this is what I read. It says, if one chick in a flock looks or behaves differently from the rest of the baby chicks, its days are numbered. Because eventually, one chicken in that flock will start pecking at that chicken that's a little bit different and they'll start pulling out the feathers of that chicken that is a little bit different, making it look even more different, which causes other chickens to start pecking at that little chicken that's different until eventually that little chicken can't survive because individuality is not tolerated in a flock of chickens. Now, unfortunately... The church of Jesus Christ is increasingly exhibiting that second danger. And it's heartbreaking. Divisions, opinions, personalities, traditions so easily divide us, creating a community with tension and conflict instead of peace and justice and agreement. We are not a people of sameness, and that often creates conflict as Christians of diversity, it can be easy to claim that God is on our side, especially when we find friends who agree with us. It takes humility to engage with and allow others to be transformed by someone different from us. In an episode of The American Life, the host says free speech doesn't solve conflict. It actually creates it. Solving conflict requires more advanced tools like trust, humility, dialogue, and listening. And that is what the dance of the Trinity reminds us of. That God made us diverse. But he also shows us how to live in harmony and unity with one another. In the Great Commission, Jesus said to go to all the nations in all their diversity knowing that there might be conflict, but what are you to do when you get there? Teach them. Teach them what? Teach them all that I have commanded you. What did Jesus command us? Jesus said all the law and the prophets are summed up in these two great commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Loving each other does not mean we have to agree with each other. We are members of one family, one human family. But members of a family don't always agree with everybody on everything, do they? Of course not. But we should recognize that the people we are disagreeing with are also our siblings. They too are children of God. And loving our siblings means we need to listen to those who are speaking. Not just wait for our turn to talk and not try so hard to convince them that our way is the right way, but listen to try to understand. Listen, listen. Just as one times one times one equals one in the Trinity, Jesus' prayer was that we all might be one, even as He and the Father are one through the power of the Spirit. 
So Jesus' prayer, I believe today, is that Protestants and Catholics, liberals and conservatives, Anglos, Asians, blacks and Hispanics, Native Americans may all find their common denominator in Christ who makes us one. The Trinity is our example of unity. United Methodist like some of the other denominations in Christianity, have a unique opportunity every time we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Community. A, ne a unique opportunity every, every time we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. And that is that we recognize that this sacrament is a table that is open to all, all people, all ages, all nations, all races. This table is open for whosoever will come. If you are tossed about with many conflicts and multiple doubts about your faith, Jesus says, come. Come, just as he said to Thomas who doubted, come. If you feel confused by life or excluded or shunned, or like you don't have a place to belong, Jesus says, come. Come to this table of grace. If you are not United Methodist and don't understand Methodism and don't want to be Methodist, Jesus says, come. Come to this table of grace. Come. Jesus says, let even the little children come. Do not stop them or hinder them. Jesus says that we all must be like children, free free to dance the movement of the Holy Spirit, Father and Son. Come, this meal is prepared for you. Theologian Moltmann says that this sacrament is not the place to practice discipline. This sacrament happens by invitation, which is as open as the outstretched arms of Jesus on the cross because he died for the reconciliation of the whole world. And so the whole world is invited to come, to come to this table, this table that is set for you and for me and for all of humanity. So I invite you to prepare your hearts and your minds to receive this holy meal as I pray. Gracious and loving God, make us one. Let your love flow so that the whole world will know we are one in you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen.